So we welcome you to the fourth session of uh, this Feshrif conference. Those of you who were here yesterday, I'm sure enjoyed the proceedings. We hope that we have more great papers today. I trust we do, given the, the panel that uh, I see in front of us. Uh, my name is Jed Woodworth. I'm a historian at the LDS Church History Department in Salt Lake City. I'd like to say a, a few words about each of our panelists today, and then I'll, I'll get out of the way. Adam Miller teaches philosophy and courses in the honors program at Collin College in McKinley, Texas. Um, when I think of Adam, I think, uh, first of all, of Terrell's talk yesterday on the provincial anti-provincialism that sometimes happens in Mormonism. Adam really is the opposite of that. He has managed to, um, to write on Mormonism in a way that is supportive, engaging, interesting, there's really no writer like him. He is a philosopher, but he's also a poet. He, is, he writes literary criticism in his writing. I find, I find him endlessly fascinating, Adam. I'll just say that. Um, so I'm really looking forward to hearing his presentation. Uh, Deidre Green is a um, graduate of Claremont Graduate University. I believe, uh, Deidre, did you work under Claudia and Richard? So you started there. She's had great mentoring also under Patrick Mason. And um, she also is doing really interesting and unique work on the intersection between Soren Kierkegaard and um, Mormonism. Kierkegaard, of course, he's a very underexplored philosopher in relation to Mormonism. We have a few um, essays written by philosophers on Kierkegaard, but I don't think anyone has fully explored his work um, in relation to Joseph Smith, and I hope that uh, Deidre is going to be uh, the first to do that. Jared Hickman, I met many years ago when he was an undergraduate at Bowdoin College in Maine, and um, Jared was writing fully formed prose at 21, I think. Um, he wrote a, an undergraduate paper on Emerson, Joseph Smith, and pragmatism, and uh, BYU brought him to, uh, to give the paper and he, I remember that he was peppered with questions from BYU religious educators. And he held up well. It was like standing before the Inquisition. It really wasn't fair to an undergraduate. But, uh, but his honors thesis was on the same subject. And it, Jared, I don't know why you never published that, but it was a brilliant honors thesis that should have been your first book. So I'll leave that with you to to figure out what you want to do with that. Um, and then finally, Ann Taves. Ann Taves um, is a brilliant historian of religion, uh, American religion. And um, she wrote a book a number of years ago called Fits, Trances, and Visions, Experiencing Religion and Explaining Experience from Wesley to James that is routinely assigned in graduate courses on the history of American religion, in which she um, tries to, to show how vision, such ecstatic experiences were explained over a huge swath of time, 150 years. And it involves science and psychology and mesmerism, and it's a very, very interesting work. And uh, she has a new book coming out. Is it out yet? Out in the Fall, with, also with Princeton. And uh, the title of that book, Anne, is, um, let's see, there it is. Revelatory Events, Three Case Studies of the Emergence of New Spiritual Paths. And um, one of those is on Mormonism. So we're looking forward to that book. So with that, Adam, go ahead. I'm, I'm grateful to be here today, uh, and I'm grateful for Richard Bushman. Apart from what were, for me at least, a few very memorable occasions, my relationship with Richard has unfolded 
obliquely and at a distance. Uh, but despite its glancing character, it has had a profound impact on me. Richard has, from the start, responded to my work with a generosity out of all proportion to that work's merit. Uh, and that generosity has, in turn, invested that work with a merit that it would not have had on its own. So thank you, Richard. Let me note up front that I am a philosopher, so sorry. <laughs> uh, as a philosopher, I'm not primarily interested in what Mormonism was or even what it is. Rather, as a philosopher, I want to know what Mormonism can do. What can it think? What can it build? What can it feel? What can it ruin? What can it heal? To understand a thing, we have to understand not just its kernel of actuality or even its line of development, but its halo of potential. We have to understand the powers that it habitually commands. In short, we have to grasp the character of its agency. With respect to the future of Mormon studies, this is my thesis. The only way to substantially define Mormonism is to grasp the shape of its power to act and to be acted upon. To grasp Mormonism, we have to connect with it as a power rather than as a thing. We have to grasp it as a verb rather than as a noun. Consider a pianist. It's apropos, uh, actually, because at this very moment in the HVAC, my 15-year-old daughter is performing as a pianist. Consider a pianist. Uh, what is a pianist? Clearly, it's not enough to just be shown a person who is a pianist. Rather, the pianist can only be understood when we grasp the shape of her power to act. That is, the pianist is grasped as a pianist only in the performance itself. But even here, and this caveat is crucial, any given piano performance will still only trace one possible path through the topology that defines her whole field of action. The pianist's power to act as a pianist isn't exhausted in the performance of any particular piece. It's not even exhausted in the performance of any number of pieces. Her power to play is broader and deeper than any particular piece or any number of pieces, and it is this power that most essentially defines her as a pianist. This same principle follows, I would argue, with practically everything. Things in general ought to be defined most fundamentally as the power to be what they are, rather than simply as what they are. And this is true for everything from quarks to people to C++ to petunias to religious traditions like Mormonism and governmental institutions like the Internal Revenue Service. What's at stake in each case is not just a thing's current state or even its historical vector, but the topology that defines its field of action as an agent. For the sake of clarity, uh, let's borrow here some language from Manuel de Landa's intensive science and virtual philosophy. As we've described things, there are three elements in play when it comes to defining Mormonism. One, the actual. Two, the potential. And three, what de Landa, following Gilles Deleuze, refers to as the virtual. We can understand, one, what is actual as the point in space occupied by a thing in its present state. What is potential as the line or vector that traces and projects the specific trajectory of a thing's past development and future actualization. And three, what is virtual as the state space that defines a thing's manifold of possible states and vectors a manifold that by definition can only ever be partially actualized in narrow slices that compared to a thing's entire field of action are exceedingly thin. As a philosopher then, what I'm interested in is not just Mormonism's actual position, that is Mormonism as a point in space, or even Mormonism's potential, that is Mormonism as a specific temporal vector, historical or projected, but this deeper category that shapes them both. I want to know what Mormonism can do. I want to grasp the virtual state space that maps Mormonism's field of action. It's helpful, as Delanda himself does, to describe the virtual as a kind of state space. 
State space is a term of art adapted from the world of engineering. In mathematical models of discrete dynamical systems, state space refers to the set of possible values a given system can generate. DeLandis simply says, state space is a space of possible states. Or again, quote, state spaces may be viewed as a way of specifying possible worlds for a given physical system, or at least possible histories for it, each trajectory in the phase portrait representing one possible historical sequence of states for a system or process, end quote. In this sense, a state space is a static representation of an agent's dynamic range of action. In order to capture the defining role played by agency or power in shaping who or what a thing is, we need to define agents not simply in terms of the point in space they currently occupy, or even in terms of the particular vector they're currently following, but in terms of the topology of their state space, a topology that determines the character of both their position and their vector. We have to grasp something deeper than the actual product of an action or even the performance of any particular process resulting in that product. We have to grasp the power of the performance itself as what defines a thing. A power that is, of course, expressed in products and particular processes, but that is in no way limited to them. We have to grasp, in short, uh, the virtual. Consider the example of a bicycle. As DeLanda indicates, in order to grasp the nature of a bicycle, we have to do more than understand the pieces that compose the bicycle, or even an assembled bicycle, or even one particular instance of the bicycle's operation. Say, for example, that we have 12 variable elements in the bicycle's field of possible action, and thus a 12-dimensional state space. Any given instance of the bicycle's operation will involve some specific realization of the possible combinations of those 12 elements, handlebars, wheels, pedals, gears, seat position, etc. At any given moment, we could represent this combination of elements as a point in space. More, we could represent the whole series of combinations through which the bicycle has turned, that is, we could represent the bicycle's history as a line moving through this same space. But in order to represent the bicycle's state space, that is the full scope of its power as a bicycle, we have to consider the set of all possible combinations of all 12 elements. This set is what defines a bicycle's state space. And this then, of course, is the virtual. This set defines not just the bicycle's application of power in a particular instance, but the shape of the bicycle's power as a power. Now, as a starting point, this kind of mechanical example is useful for illustrating what's involved in the virtual. But in order to better grasp what's at stake in Mormonism's state space, we'd be better off working with examples that are fundamentally organic rather than reductively mechanical. Say we take, instead of a bicycle, something like the unfolding of an embryo. In this case, a kind of state space is also in play, a state space that shapes the field of action in which the embryo's power unfolds. But unlike a bicycle, the organic character of the embryo entails feedback loops that allow for the state space itself to change shape in response to the realization of specific trajectories. That is, in complex scenarios that involve reflexivity and recursivity, a given agent's state space will itself be a moving target, a target that moves and changes shape in response to realized vectors. In other words, in cases involving things like life, language, and consciousness, the virtual must itself be explicitly modeled as dynamic. In cases like this, state spaces will, in turn, have their own state spaces. Well, things are getting a little complicated now, but I think you've got the basic idea. Let's leave these descriptions for the moment and return to the question of Mormonism. What can Mormonism do? What is the nature of the virtual that simultaneously defines the field in which Mormonism's actual history, present condition, and future trajectory unfold? Though this kind of question is itself properly philosophical, to generate answers will nonetheless need to mobilize a host of disciplines in response. History, for instance, is clearly pivotal. Mormonism's past trajectory through its state space will be exhibit A in any attempt to map the shape of that space. But Mormonism is a complex assemblage of only partially compatible and often competing subsets 
of people, ideas, institutions, texts, real estate investments, etc. And the more data points we can amass in more disciplines, theology, literature, sociology, anthropology, religious studies, rhetoric, political theory, economics, biology, etc., then the more the organic and reflexive shape of Mormonism's state space will itself come into focus. But what then of Mormon philosophy? What discipline-specific role would philosophy play in Mormon studies? In my admittedly prescriptive view, philosophy's discipline-specific question is the virtual. Philosophy's job is, first of all, to pose the question of the virtual, and then to rally a collaborative and cross-disciplinary investigation of this question. This, for example, is quite explicitly the kind of work that we do in the Mormon Theology Seminar. But more than this, I think the philosophy also bears a discipline-specific responsibility for framing hypothetical scenarios that can force the question of the virtual and then probe in especially pointed ways regions of Mormon state space that our present situation and our historical trajectory may have left largely untouched. In this way, it's one of Mormon philosophy's primary responsibilities to hypothesize, speculate, and extrapolate about just what it is that Mormonism can do. What is the Mormon virtual? What are Mormonism's distinctive powers? What centers of gravity most profoundly warp the shape of its state space? More than outlining the bounds of a Mormon actuality, either past or present, philosophy must address the shape of Mormonism's power, not just for the sake of some unrealized possibilities, but because, as with the pianist, we will never understand even what the actual is unless we acquire some feel for the shape of the virtual power that performatively gives actuality itself. As a practical matter, I think this means that much of Mormon philosophy should frequently and explicitly be conducted as a brand of fiction. Mormon philosophy should extrapolate fictional scenarios from available Mormon materials, perhaps especially Mormon scripture, stage these scenarios in clearly defined conceptual sandboxes, and then use these fictions to probe the shape of the Mormon virtual. On this score, we might see this particular element of Mormon philosophy as being similar in many respects to something like hard science fiction. As Stephen Shaviro argues in Discognition, quote, hard science fiction is a special kind of literature, one that operates through speculation and extrapolation and that takes place conceptually, if not grammatically, in the future tense, end quote. Hard science fiction constructively estranges us from the actuality of what seems obvious in the present moment by displacing us into a skewed but adjacent future. This kind of estrangement from our present actuality is a powerful tool for bringing the virtual into view. Practicing fiction for the sake of mapping the virtual state space that defines the shape of Mormonism as a power and not just as a thing, even a historical thing, Philosophy engages in a version of what the contemporary French philosopher Francois La Ruel calls Christo-fiction. Christo-fiction is a style of speculative inquiry that actively refuses to identify the entity under investigation with its current actuality, or even its traceable vector, in order instead to attend to the shape of the state space that gives both. Suspending the assumption that the actual is sufficient to define a thing, Christofiction is, in this case, an attempt to view both the actuality and potentiality of Mormonism as the expression of an underlying virtuality that, I would argue, we might properly call the body of Christ. As a Mormon philosopher probing the nature of Mormonism's state space, this is my working hypothesis. The body of Christ is Mormonism's virtual body. Christofiction, then, is an apt name for the philosophical work of extrapolating fictional scenarios in rigorously constructed conceptual sandboxes in order to bring this Christic state space more clearly into view. Before closing, let me offer just one example of a Christofiction to illustrate how such a fiction might illuminate what Mormonism can do. The example was drawn from an actual, though nascent, project that Rosalind Welch and I are currently assembling. In 1995, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints first published its landmark statement, The Family, a Proclamation to the World. 
sensing an eminent sea change in the Western world's commonly accepted definitions of marriage, family, and gender, church leaders introduced the proclamation in order to clarify and codify its own theological and political positions on these issues. A novel and striking document, the proclamation declares that men and women are created in the image of heavenly parents, that gender is an essential characteristic of eternal identity, that salvation is inextricably tied to marriage and family life, and that men and women, despite differences in their divinely assigned roles, must work as equal partners. Equal partners. Consider then the following Christo fiction. Imagine that a hundred years have passed. The year is 2095, and the proclamation has now been officially canonized for more than 60 years. In this future church, the proclamation has been enshrined as the cornerstone of a Mormon account of life in Christ. But now, framed by a century of social and political upheaval, the document's original sense has become increasingly obscure. Common sense definitions of key terms like gender, definitions taken for granted as obvious and incontestable by its original authors, are no longer common or obvious. A whole generation of senior church leaders, all born decades after the proclamation's introduction and educated in a world where the predicted sea change in sexual mores and family structures were a fait accompli, are left to wonder exactly what the church itself means by gender. What is gender? What does it mean to claim that sexual difference is eternal? How can men and women have gendered responsibilities and yet act as, quote, equal partners? In short, senior leaders are forced to ask, what is sexual difference and what is sexual equality? Recognizing that answers to such questions must now be actively constructed rather than passively assumed, in this fictional scenario, church leaders decide to draw on Mormonism's long acknowledged, but as a practical matter, never actually decisive, theological commitment to a kind of radical philosophical materialism. Working within this Christo-fictional framework, Rosalind and I then propose a rigorous philosophical model for a radical materialism and attempt to extrapolate what answers to these kinds of questions might look like. If, the, if this scenario unfolded and we worked within these conceptual constraints, then what would result? What particular states, that is, what particular paths through the state space of Christ's virtual body might Mormonism trace? And in particular, what might these speculative paths reveal about the shape of the state space that even today, here and now, gives and defines both our Mormon present and our Mormon past? This is just one example, uh, one that I can't do more than loosely frame here. But it seems to me asking these kinds of questions with these kinds of methods and toward these kinds of ends will define the future of our work in Mormon philosophy and ultimately, they may help redefine what we think it means to be engaged in Mormon studies in general. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here. Thanks to, to Spencer and to Jed and to Kathleen and all the others involved in putting together this this event. I'm really so honored to have been asked to participate in this occasion uh, honoring Richard Bushman. Since I first met him in the summer of 2000 under the auspices of the then Smith Fellowship here at BYU, uh, Richard has been for me uh, a professional and personal model, guide, and support. He's been far kinder to me than I deserve, writing letters of recommendation and introduction in a pinch. Uh, advising me in various travails, uh, ever reaching out the hand of mentorship and friendship. He and Claudia have been a, a massively formative influence uh, on my and my wife Amy's lives, and it's a profound pleasure to be able to pay tribute in some small way here. That tribute comes in the form of a deliberately, but also suitably outrageous argument. Uh, I say suitably because Richard, at the end of our fellowship summer together, uh, wrote me a letter, which has meant a great deal to me, in which he offered a certain characterization of me. He probably doesn't remember the content of that characterization, and I'm certainly not gonna reveal it here. Uh, but this presentation is offered in a humble attempt to fulfill that billing. <laughs> 
So part of the fun of this talk for you, I hope, is that you are hereby invited to attempt to guess on the basis of my talk uh, what exactly Richard wrote to me, right? Unhinged madman you may uh, end up with, but you make the call. Um, and, uh, and I want to uh, uh, borrow some really helpful language uh, from Adam's talk and, and suggest that yeah, what, what, I, what I'm putting forward today may very well be thought of as a virtual Mormonism rather than an actual or potential uh, Mormonism uh, and uh, something that is available, I want to insist, within Mormonism's topology of state space. So I've gathered what I have to say under the rubric of the perverse core of Mormonism. My title is an echo of the Slovenian theorist and intellectual without portfolio, Slavoj Žižek's recent defense of the Christian legacy. In a nutshell, Žižek offers a counterintuitive Marxist response to the Christian and other fundamentalisms and New Age spiritualisms that, by his account, plague contemporary society. Zizek refuses the obvious answer that the Marxists should, quote, ferociously attack these fundamentalisms and spiritualisms, and furthermore, mercilessly denounce the remainders of the religious legacy within Marxism itself. Instead, he suggests Marxists affirm that, quote, there is a direct lineage from Christianity to Marxism, that Christianity and Marxism should fight on the same side of the barricade against the onslaught of new spiritualisms, end quote. So through a series of dialectical turns, Zizek ends up asserting that Christianity harbors in its perverse core what might seem to be its exact opposite, the atheistic materialism of Marx. As he puts it um, at the end of his book, uh, uh, The Puppet and the Dwarf, when Christ dies, what dies with him is the secret hope discernible in Father, why hast thou forsaken me? The hope that there is a Father who has abandoned me. The Holy Spirit uh, that comes to, uh, in Christ's absence, right, to, um, uh, to, to, uh, to, to be the sort of the, the medium of Christian spiritual life is, in Zizek's words, the community deprived of its support in the big other, right? In other words, uh, a human community tasked with the revolutionary transformation of its material conditions. Hence, Zizek finds himself defending Christian orthodoxy because he understands it as an indispensable resource and feeder for the Marxism that he prizes. So in a similar fashion too, but also as a, as a dialectical extension of Zizek's argument, I will suggest that Mormonism, understood as one of the onslaught of new spiritualisms that he decries, contains at its perverse core that which might well seem to be its exact opposite, decolonization, including the repudiation of Christian evangelization and the valorization of non-Christian spiritual traditions. So if for Zizek, Christianity leads to Marx, then for me, Mormonism might be said to lead to Franz Fanon, the great black Martinican anti-colonial theorist and activist. So the perversity here is no doubt manifest, but just to spell it out, uh, a movement that played a central role in the colonial settlement of the United States, West, the North American West and beyond, variously marginalizing thousands of indigenous peoples in the process, and that has proven loath to condemn outright its theological and practical racism might contain within itself, specifically in its distinctive eponymous text, the Book of Mormon, a tendency or a potentiality that would undo that very history and point toward a radically different, unrecognizable future. So on the off-off chance that this claim might be made remotely convincing, um, let me briefly elaborate two interlinked theses. One, that Mormonism is genetically secular. And two, that Mormon messianism, as initially articulated in and through the Book of Mormon, is thereby post-Christian. Emergent well after the origin date of Charles Taylor's secular age in 1500, Mormon not, Mormonism not only exhibits the birthmark 
as it were, of secularity, but perhaps something like a birthright. Or alternatively, Mormonism not only bears the marks of secularity, but also marks the, from a certain standpoint, surprising possibilities within that secularity. So quick review of Taylor's three secularities. A lot of people here probably know about these, right? But uh, secularity one, as he glosses it, right, is the, ex the expulsion of religion from sphere after sphere of public life. Secularity two is this, uh, this notion of the, the decline of the inexorable decline of religious belief and practice. And secularity three, which is what he's interested in and what I'm, what I'm interested in as well, is in his words, quote, the conditions of experience of and search for the spiritual that make it possible to speak of ours as a secular age, right? So, you know, uh, uh, so Taylor is against what he calls subtra subtraction stories, right? So secularity one and two, this notion of an inexorable decline of, of religion or of the, uh, the relentless uh, privatization of, of religion are, are, are phenomena that he wants to acknowledge, but he's interested in a set of conditions that he calls secularity three that that make possible those positions, but also that theoretically exceeds them, right? That there might be other possibilities within that secularity that uh, are not exhausted by the sort of standard secularization narrative that we've gotten, right? So Taylor speaks of what he calls an imminent frame, right? That there, has, there is an undeniable transformation that has happened, that must be acknowledged, that must be theorized. Um, but it's not necessarily um, a sort of inexorable decline of what gets called religion um, that is um, uh, on the docket uh, for all of us in this imminent frame. For my purposes in this, in this paper going forward, I will make a distinction that I sort of wish that, that, that Taylor did between secularity and secularism, right? So what he calls secularity one and two, notion of decline and notion of sort of privatization or marginalization of religion, I will refer to as secularism. Um, one is, a, we could think of a sort of a political form of secularism, the separation of church and state, right? Um, and then uh, the other is an ideological form of, of secularism, right? This idea that religion is destined to, you know, to, to go extinct or should go extinct. There's a set of normative claims and descriptive claims that sort of go with that. So over and against those secularisms, whenever I say secular or secularity in this, this talk, I'm talking about that broader set of conditions that in Taylor's account yield more possible sort of moral and spiritual options to use his language than are typically acknowledged in standard secularization narratives. So now we're ready to talk about what I mean by saying that Mormonism is genetically secular. So Mormonism is a limit case, I think, uh, both an extreme example of secularity. It's born under those conditions, right? Think of something as simple as the weird sort of hybrid of the Book of Mormon that carries with it a set of supernatural claims, but also a set of expectations of empirical verification. Think of Martin Harris taking, you know, taking the manuscript, some of the characters from the, from uh, the Book of Mormon to professors at secular university, universities and expecting them to be verified by those figures. So Mormonism, a limit case, both of an, an extreme example of secularity and also a liminal transgressive phenomenon vis-a-vis -vis those increasingly well-worn phenomenological pathways within secularity that might be encapsulated as secularism, right? Um, so Mormonism, uh, whether, as I said, glossed a moment ago, in its narrow political sense of church-state separation, which denominates something called religion in the first place and allots it a specific role in the private domain, or in its broader ideological sense of a self-consciously non or even anti-religious worldview. Mormonism has never sat well with either of these secularisms, but the secularity that enables but also exceeds those secularisms, I am saying, is, Mormonis uh, is Mormonism's native element, and Mormonism is an invaluable index of that secularity. In sum, Mormonism is both fundamentally secular and non or post secularist. It stands for secularities, dare we say, transcendence of secularism. <laughs> 
So even more strongly, Mormonism might be apprehended, not only as born necessarily laboring under the burden of justifying what might be deemed transcendental claims, but also as carrying the possibility of the imminent frame's sufficiency as a source of ultimate value. Indeed, I've come to think that one way to conceptualize what are arguably the most distinctive doctrines of early Mormonism, its materialism, its fantasy of apotheosis, is precisely as the radical extension of the imminent frame to encompass even the nominally absolute God of Christian theism, thereby leaving no transcendental outside. In other words, Mormonism would be precisely, in this case, what the Christian novelist Marilyn Robinson, who's seemingly a darling of Mormon intellectuals at the moment, uh, to judge by the recent Mormon scholars in the Humanities Conference on Secularisms, uh, Mormonism would be precisely the thing that Robinson deplores in her recent essays. Uh, in her words, quote, the scaling upward to infinity of the properties of the quasi-reality that holds us at a remove from the world's true workings. Right? So I find myself then intoning somewhat against what might be called the Christianization of Mormonism. Instead of lusting after the flesh pots of Christian orthodoxy, to borrow Sterling McMurrin's memorable phrase, Mormonism might explore its post-Christian secularity, not secularism. Uh, for instance, pursuing McMurrin's thought that Mormonism out-humanisms secular humanism and the standard forms of religious liberalism in its extravagant conception of human possibility. What if we were to seize on the contingencies of Mormonism's historical emergence and imagine it not so much as a bona fide Christian religion as an envelope-pushing secular phenomenology? For one, uh, this might make clear the ways the Book of Mormon may be an original con contribution to a distinctively modern post-Christian tradition of messianic thought. The Book of Mormon gives us something like a messianicity without messianism, to borrow Jacques Derrida's phrase, and also a messiah without messianicity. Um, I'm only gonna have time to deal with the, the, the first part, uh, the, the first of those formulations. So modern messianic thought associated with philosophers like Derrida and Walter Benjamin has recently been historicized by Anna Glazova and Paul North as arising from a confrontation with what, what might be called the anti-Messianic thought of extinction, right? With the notion of catastrophe as a non-causal and atelic force that may lead to irredeemable loss. Once it's gone, it's gone, it ain't coming back, right? Modern messianic thought, they write, represents, quote, a last and most desperate attempt to return to the idea of loss as redeemable, uh, precisely in the face of the possible loss of what they call the messianic model of loss, which is to say traditional Judeo-Christian theological convictions regarding messianic redemption. Hence, modern messianic thoughts attempted return to a notion of redeemable loss cannot be a simple one. Right? One can't unthink the thought of extinction. Quote, once eschatological certainty is depleted or shaken, the messianic thought asks to be rethought or replaced. Two possibilities readily present themselves, either to understand history as a gradual process of fulfillment without reference to a supernatural order, or to posit history as constitutionally lacking a purpose. End quote. Both of these possibilities incapacitate hope uh, Glazo Glazova and North suggest, because they don't allow for any discontinuity of time. Hence, discontinuity, Glazova and North note, comes to be the only hope for history, and modern messianic thought is, in their words, in effect, a species of discontinuity. So Glazova and North rather conventionally trace this tradition to the horrified response of Enlightenment skeptics, such as Voltaire, to the 1755 Lisbon earthquake. Um, and their collection is suggestively titled Messianic Thought Outside Theology. Um, the implication is that the modernity of messianic thought, messianic thought chastened or haunted by the thought of extinction, consists precisely in its migration outside theology to enlightened philosophy, and further, that any messianic thought inside theology is anti-modern and reactionary, in denial about the possibility of extinction, myopic in its transcendental convictions. 
By contrast, I would trace the anti-Messianic thought of extinction, with which any modern Messianic scheme has to reckon, to the belief beggaring debacle of native genocide beginning in the 16th century, and underscore the fact that much of the response to this primal scene of the thought of extinction occurred in theological discourses, including, of course, the Book of Mormon. In my globalist corrective of Glazova and North's account, the anti-Messianic thought of extinction is bound up with the historical revelation of planetary finitude in the Americas and the cosmos shattering conundrum of first the existence and then the potential non-existence of the indigenous peoples of the Americas. In this context, the Book of Mormon can be appreciated as an example of messianic thought solicited by, but also as I've suggested, shot through with the contemplation of this particular loss as an irretrievable one. If we take the globe with a neat literalism as the imminent frame that produces the phenomenological effects in which Taylor is interested, the fact that the Book of Mormon bids to be scripture by way of being a history of Indians begins to make more sense. So let me conclude, um, this is fun for me, by engaging my co-panelist Adam Miller's quite brilliant and groundbreaking application of Walter Benjamin's version of modern messianism to the Book of Mormon. I will all too briefly walk through Adam's argument and highlight a different turn that might be made at a critical juncture. In 1827, this is, yeah, uh, me glossing Adam, glossing Benjamin. Um, in 1827, Joseph digs up a material object, the golden plates. This is, in Benjamin's terms, the historian or collector's vital encounter with a forgotten historical object, an object charged with aura, in part by virtue of what Miller calls the brute material incongruity of that object's unexpected continuing subsistence. How could this thing still be around? It no longer has a place in this world, to borrow Adam's helpful colloquializing paraphrase. In the case of the Book of Mormon, this point is underscored by the fact that for Smith, this historical object, the plates, is obviously linked to a population, the indigenous inhabitants of the Americas, understood by many in his moment to be appointed by the march of history for erasure, whether by death or deracination. This presencing of a repressed past thus troubles what had seemed the inexorable linear unfolding of history. This is the messianic rupture for Benjamin, and it enables, in Adam's words, a retroactive reconfiguration of history under the aegis of which the present and range of possible futures suddenly look radically different. In the case of the Book of Mormon, a continent whose destiny as the home of a Euro-Christian settler civilization seemed to so many to be manifest, that is self-evidently appointed as such by providence by virtue of the ongoing accomplishments of the colonial project, is impossibly restored to its displaced and decimated indigenous inhabitants who are elevated as the primary actors in the building of a new heaven and earth in their homeland. So what the Book of Mormon actually tries to pull off is the enactment of a messianic disruption of the empty homogenous time of native attrition and anathematization, the everyday of colonialism. This through its presentation of itself as a record of ancient American Israelites whose contents will empower modern native Americans by helping them recognize they are a covenant people with claim upon God. This, it seems to me, is where the logic of a Benjaminian reading of the Book of Mormon would lead. Benjamin, after all, was a historical materialist in the Marxian tradition, someone focused on seizing those rare revolutionary chances in history that would transform human life. Someone who, in his Paralipomena to On the Concept of History, straightforwardly declared that Marx secularized the idea of messianic time, and that was a good thing. Um, so the decolonization I'm arguing the Book of Mormon might be understood to call for seems to me a messianic history of the sort Benjamin might appreciate. Um, but this is not quite where Adam's Benjamin leads us. Instead, in a manner consistent with the rebranding of the Book of Mormon as another testament of Jesus Christ, 
he reverses the priorities on the title page of the Book of Mormon, which makes native renewal rather than Christian evangelization the text's primary purpose. Um, in a kind of tautology, Miller argues that uh, the Book of Mormon's messianicity in the end consists in its, quote, own explicit purpose of testifying universally that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, manifesting himself unto all nations. This, it seems to me, is plain old messianicity with messianism. But by Benjamin's lights, this cannot be the messianic event in this specific context. For insofar as this project of Christian evangelization in the Americas was part and parcel of a colonial project to kill the Indian and save the man, it more properly belongs to what Benjamin, in Adam's own paraphrase, identifies as that universal history elaborated from the victor's point of view, the thing that the messianic would interrupt. In other words, the Christianization of Native Americans where they survived and remained was, in Joseph Smith's moment, understood to be part of the business of usu as usual of secular history. In what would the messianic rupture consist then? Paradoxically, challengingly, might the Book of Mormon be taken to suggest that the messianic event that it itself inaugurates necessitates the con contradiction rather than consummation of familiar and traditional notions of Christian messianism? Might the Book of Mormon be taken to suggest that its faithful readers will honor and sustain native peoples as they are without any missionary agenda or paternalistic presumptions? To what extent does the Book of Mormon commit its faithful readers to the project of decolonization, an undeniable part of which is the renewal and reinvention of non-Christian native spiritual practices? Thank you. Well, like everybody else, I, I would like to begin by thanking Spencer and the other organizers for inviting me here. I've been having a lot of fun at this conference, and I should let you know that when I accepted the invitation, I specifically asked Spencer to assign me to a session that would be fun to think about. <laughs> and I have to say that he obliged me. The challenge, of course, is to figure out how Christo fiction, women as theologians, and the perverse core of messianism fit together or at least speak to one another. Especially, I would add, in light of the fact that both Deidre and Jared <clears throat> modified their papers considerably from the ones that they gave me. Okay. I think this will still work, however. So, titles aside, I think there are some clear conversations going on here. The first is a conversation between Green and Miller about the 1996 statement on the family, which Green approaches directly and Miller somewhat more obliquely, but comes to in his concluding example. So, as Miller makes clear in his conclusion, both want to read the statement on the family in new ways, but they approach it from opposite directions. Green turns primarily to the past, and Miller turns to the future. The second conversation is one which you actually heard right here between Hickman and Miller about the Book of Mormon, building on earlier papers by both of them. Both past and future are present in Hickman's approach to the Book of Mormon, at least in the paper that I received. The past as historical context and the future as hermeneutical rereading. So in addition to conversations about the family or gender on the one hand and the Book of Mormon on the other, we also have a conversation I think in this session about the interplay between past and future the role of history and the role of hermeneutics, whether literary or philosophical, in moving forward. So I'm going to do these papers in a different order. I'm going to start with Green, who argues that there are good grounds within current teaching and the tradition to justify Latter-day Saint women becoming equal partners in doing theology, at least with 
in the context of marriage, and she hopes well beyond. But her argument isn't just historical, it's also theological insofar as it rests on the connection she sees between President Nelson's call for women who can speak with the power and authority of God and the Hafen's article on becoming equal partners. Women, she's arguing, won't be able to speak with power and authority unless couples overcome the division of labor between men as theologians and women as Christians, or we might say women, uh, men as thinkers and women as doers. She offers historical evidence that suggests that LDS women have occasionally stepped beyond the more circumscribed role of exemplifying the faith, but she doesn't take on what I take to be the elephant in the room. That is the underlying assumption of gender essentialism and complementarity. And for me, I want to suggest that this idea goes back to the New Testament, to the idea that the husband is head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, and that this text from Ephesians undergirds the complementary relationships between husband and wife, male priesthood, and female laity. And, that's, and that this analogy drawn from Ephesians 5 is deeply embedded not only in Mormonism, but in Catholic and evangelical theology as well. In appealing to Mormonism's commitment to gender essentialism to explain why women's theological voice needs to be heard, she follows, as I read her, in the footsteps of 19th century evangelical women who used women's nature as mothers as a basis for extending their sphere of activity from the home to mothering in the world. So Green's approach, I have to confess, and this may be my own limitation, brings back to me memories of my own forays into both feminist theology and history in the 1980s. And these forays left me with a definite sense of the limits of a historical approach in traditions that have placed this Ephesians analogy at their core. Obviously, I could be wrong about the LDS case, but it's with that sense of history's limits in terms of precipitating change that I turn to the other two papers, which I view as offering alternative ways of reinventing Mormonism. Specifically, I think that the project that Adam Miller and Rosalind Welch are envisioning, rooted in what Miller refers to as Christo-fiction, offers an alternative way of approaching issues of gender, and one that I suspect they hope will allow them to address issues at a more fundamental level. I think Miller is offering a potentially innovative way forward, but one that, like Green, doesn't face the Ephesians 5 problem in his reframing of Mormonism as the body of Christ as directly as I think might be helpful. But I'm getting ahead of myself, so let me back up. Mormon, or Miller gets to Mormonism as the body of Christ in two steps. First, he argues that to grasp Mormonism, we have to connect it with a power, as a power rather than as a thing. And second, he turns to Christo fiction as a means of doing this. So let's begin with the first step here. Miller argues the only way to substantially define Mormonism is to grasp the shape of its power to act and be acted upon. Conceived as a verb, he views Mormonism as an agent, but he defines agency so broadly that it does not require consciousness or even sentience. This definition, in my view, is just a tad too broad. Agency, in my view, requires an ability to act, which I would argue does require sentience. But this isn't to say that I think Miller's idea makes no sense. I just think that Mormonism per se, I just don't think that Mormonism per se is sentient. So I'm thinking Mormonism itself does not act. I think his references to Mormonism as a dynamic system make more sense. 
As such, it's a human collectivity made up of individuals organized into various types of units, families, wards, stakes, quorums, you guys know all that, that interact in environments according to certain rules or dynamic principles that constitute it as a particular system. So when he says that he wants to know what Mormonism can do, we can think of that, I think, in terms of what happens when people act and are acted upon in the roles they take on as parts of the system. The roles they're allowed to play in the system will influence the effect they will have on the system and the way the overall system will change in response to their action. This isn't exactly where Miller wants to go, however, as his turn to Christo fiction indicates. In his second step, Miller connects Mormonism with Christianity in general, as de depicted in France wa la Roel's um, recent work. But here too, I think his broad definition of agency creates confusion because la Roel's Christo fiction isn't about Christianity. It's about Christ, a transgressive heretical Christ, which is interesting, but beside the point, so I won't go there. My point is that from a theological perspective, it makes a whole lot more sense to me to speak of Christ as an agent than either Christianity or Mormonism. Within the Christian tradition, Christ is, of course, understood as an agent, and the church, and thus the system as a whole, as Christ's body. So characterizing Mormonism, or I would say more precisely, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, uh, as Christ's body makes sense to me theologically. My difficulty is that with Adam's extremely broad definition of agency, he's managed to talk about Mormonism or the church as the body of Christ without talking about any body parts. No head, arms, feet, etc. It's the absence of body parts that is roles within the body that led me to say at the outset that I think that he, like Green, is sidestepping the Ephesians problem, as I call, I'm calling it, even as he tacitly relies on it in connecting the body of Christ to the 1996 LDS statement on the family, just as Ephesians depicts the family as a microcosm of the church. But again, my point here is not to dismiss Miller's core idea, which is to treat Mormon philosophy as a brand of fiction and extrapolate fictional scenarios from available Mormon materials, stage these scenarios in clearly defined conceptual sandboxes, and then use these fictions to probe the shape of the Mormon virtual. Within this fictional framework, Miller can then ask questions of an imagined future generation of senior church leaders that I assume he feels can't be asked in the present. What is gender? What does it mean to claim that sexual difference is eternal? How can men and women have gendered responsibilities and yet act as equal partners? In short, he said, asks what is sexual difference and what is sexual equality? This, I think, provides an ingenious way to explore questions that might otherwise be impossible to ask. Finally, in the paper I received, Hickman offers us a reading of the Book of Mormon <laughs> against <laughs> the backdrop of Charles Taylor's analysis. You got the Zizek version. Taylor does come in a little bit. Anyway, but he, he was bigger in my version. Anyway, against the backdrop of Charles Taylor's understanding of ours as a global secular age that emerged out of the encounter of peoples with diverse cosmologies. Born in the secular age, he argues that the Book of Mormon does not simply react to it, but takes advantage of it in new and creative ways. Hickman pushes back, you heard this part, against the Christianization of Mormonism that Green and Miller seem to presuppose and encourages us to explore its post-Christian secularity. Hickman does so by placing the Book of Mormon within the larger frames beloved by literary critics. Taylor's imminent frame in secular age, Benjamin's messianic time, and Derrida's messianicity without messianism. <laughs> 
And in doing so, he asserts the claim that the Book of Mormon can be taken seriously at these most august of theoretical levels. If his larger claim as literary critic is to bring the Book of Mormon into this most sophisticated of hermeneutical playgrounds, he does so, I think, and this is the part you didn't get, with an evident desire to overcome traditional polarities in Book of Mormon scholarship with respect to the way that the Book of Mormon messed, so to speak, with time. So as he put it in the other version of his paper, Book of Mormon criticism has largely proceeded on an erroneous assumption that the text's anachronism, its fast and looseness with time, is its dirty little secret something for the secularist critic triumphantly to expose in order to show the book is a modern fabrication or for the religious apologist to anxiously explain away in order to preserve the core sense of the Book of Mormon as a miraculously retrieved ancient record. Rather than replicate these old oppositions, Hickman wants to draw attention to how unabashedly the text bends temporality, temporality, how unembarrassedly integral its anachronism is, and to argue that this makes it worth understanding, not as some dirty little secret, but as a formal, indeed central feature of the text. To illustrate, and I'm really glad I put these quotes in, he notes the book's point of departure, and here I'm quoting, Lehi is warned of the Babylonian captivity 13 years before it happens by way of a book given to him by men who will not be born for another 600 years, Jesus' apostles. And then, in what was my favorite line of the paper, he says, the Book of Mormon is a wormhole right from the get-go. So I think Hickman does a brilliant job both in the part you got in terms of the Native American reading and in the other part that I'm talking about. He does a brilliant job of connecting the Book of Mormon's collapse of space-time with the discussions of temporality and messianism in Benjamin and Derrida. But he doesn't ground this collapse of time in the Book of Mormon as fully as he might in relation to the biblical text. For me, this collapse of time has always stood out as a key feature of the Book of Mormon, and one I have long associated with controversies over the typological interpretation of scripture. Typologies basically presuppose that an event can have more than one meaning, its historical or literal meaning in its own time, and a meaning in relation to a future event that it foreshadows. Christianity is typological to its core. Adam is a type of Christ, who is in turn the new Adam, which sets up the arc of fall and redemption. Similarly, the Old Testament prefigures the New Testament. In grafting the new onto the old, the Hebrew scriptures were reread in light of the early Christians' faith in Jesus as the Messiah. But all these perceived foreshadowings were just that, illusions that could be read as references, but they weren't spelled out. Ever since I read Phil Barlow's Mormons in the Bible, I've thought of the Book of Mormon as an effort to make these allusions explicit. Jesus is not just prefigured, vaguely sensed in retrospect. He actually showed up. If you take Christian claims grounded in typological thinking seriously, if you hold to both levels of meaning and push them in a literal historical direction, you wind up, I think, creating just the sort of wormholes Hickman is discussing. So in conclusion, this LDS turned hermeneutics, both literary and, and philosophical, is producing some real breakthroughs, I think, in terms of both theological insights and envisioning alternative futures. As an outsider looking in, I find these efforts most compelling when they remain in touch with the text, in the case of Book of Mormon criticism, and grapple, as Green does, with deeply rooted structural premises of the church, in the case of gender roles. 
and at the same time allow us to see new possibilities for engaging and transforming them that we didn't see before. Thank you. Well, we'd like to thank our panelists once again. We have about 10 minutes for questions. As, um, as we did yesterday, we have a microphone right here in the middle. Um, if you want to guess Jared Hickman's character type, please limit your guesses to one so that we have a chance for everyone who wants to guess. So go ahead. Don't worry, Jared, this one's not for you, although I would like to meet you in the parking lot in 15 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, actually, Dr. Green, um, I, uh, I teach Book of Mormon here, uh, and I'm trying to do more to encourage my, um, my women students to uh, engage in theology. I'm, I'm, I'm getting this, you know, we're getting this wave of, of recently returned missionaries, and they've got this, this zeal for sharing the gospel, and how do I encourage that without mansplaining, um, and uh, um, just in a way that, I, I, what got you interested in it, I guess, and, and what might be some effective uh, things I could say that would encourage them to pursue that? Thanks for that question. Um, I will say that um, it was quite a surprise to me to decide to go to divinity school um, after my missionary service. I had a very different vision for my life, and I won't bother you with that now. Um, I will say that as a young undergraduate, um, it was really special for me to have professors who encouraged me to go to graduate school. And, you know, I graduated in 2001 from BYU, so it wasn't probably as common then as it is now for young women to be encouraged to do that. Um, but I would say, you know, I was a philosophy major here at BYU. I was mentored by David Paulson and worked for him as an undergraduate, and uh, that really um, shaped me. Um, I'll say one thing in, in honor of David that I think is appropriate to some of the conversations we're having today. And that's that, uh, and I actually wrote him as a young missionary to thank him um, for what he modeled for me as a young Latter-day Saint. And that was that um, whenever sort of really difficult questions were asked in our philosophy courses, um, you know, other professors might shy away and kind of sweep it under the rug and, and move on to a safer topic. And David never did that. He would always address whatever question a, a student brought up and ask for the class to work communally uh, to think through these difficult problems. Um, and, and as I have told him multiple times, for me, that really modeled a type of confidence that Mormonism could stand up to difficult questions. and. Um, and, and kind of his own confidence in that. And I thought that it engendered that, that in me as well. Um, so I think that modeling a certain way of approaching difficult questions um, about Mormonism and the world um, is something that, that can encourage um, people to do that. And as you seem to think, it needs to be in a rather indirect way. Um, does that answer your question? Is that? Yeah. OK, thanks. thanks. Well, this panel was great fun. Uh, thank you to all three presenters. I thought Ann Taze's response was really insightful. Um, and I have uh, questions that are specific questions for each one, but I won't ask those questions here, maybe later. Let me ask a, kind of a, a, a meta question. And I guess it, it could be for any of the above, but maybe for, me, for, for, for Adam and Jared. Um, you know, there are two ways, it seems to me, you can approach the whole intersection between uh, sort of Mormonism and uh, sort of intellectual culture broadly, theory more specifically. You know, whether you're going by Delanda, Deleuze, et cetera, or by way of Benjamin, Zizek, et cetera. One can, you know, sort of take theories, uh, think what they might mean in relation to religious texts like the Book of Mormon or Mormonism, and, 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 and bring new insights onto Mormonism from those places, right? Uh, to where it looks like Mormonism, it's actually troped by way of Delanda, Deleuze, et cetera. So it's like, so Deleuzeanism applied to things that are Mormon. Or the converse is also possible, right? You take a, a Mormon paradigm, you ask yourself, what might this mean when brought into conversation with 
intellectual culture, right? So when, when, when how, how might that change what Deleuze, Delanda, Benjamin Zizek mean or think they're saying? And my question is just how do you negotiate those two things, those two possible trajectories uh, in your own uh, work around topics like this? Good question. Uh, it's bloody, <laughs> I think, in the sense that uh, everything is always bleeding into everything else. And sometimes that's just messy, and sometimes that's productive. And I think a lot of what's involved in, in decent scholarship is being able to figure out which kind of, which kind of bloodiness is useful and which kind is best just left aside. I mean, one example for me would be something like uh, if we take the work of Francois Laruelle, uh, I think there's a way in which the very thing that's at stake, for instance, in Christo fiction, the very, the very model of, uh, of, of a Christianity without a father that instead privileges the son, I think Mormonism itself uh, provides a kind of uh, uh, antecedent example of the very kind of uh, model of Christianity that Laruelle has in mind, and I think it, it, can, it can fill out and reshape in really productive ways uh, what Laura Weld is kind of groping after. So that would be an example, I think, of, a, of Mormonism kind of bleeding out uh, into a rereading of Laura Weld. And I think that kind of thing it happens all the time. I think I would echo, echo that. That's one of the things I find most inspiring about about Adam's work and something that I yeah try to, to emulate and do myself. I'm interested in finding ways to make Mormonism itself a theoretical center of of gravity, right? And um, yeah, and in the particular case here, as I you know as I put it, to think about you know the Book of Mormon as an original contribution to what might be called modern messianic thought, well before um, you know Benjamin and Derrida are on the scene. So. Um, yeah, I guess I'm still. Yeah, I'm enough of a uh, of a, a Mormon to my core. A Mormon, ex maybe I'm guilty of Mormon exceptionalism on some level, in the sense that that, yeah, I, I I'm uh, the model of sort of you know applying sort of a theory that has some sort of cachet in the secular academy in order to sort of make Mormonism look cooler, right? Is has always been something that I've I've found myself trying to trying not to do, right, and trying to find a, a, a way to, um, uh, to, to understand and represent Mormonism as this, this just this vital um, uh, resource, right, for, in, in, in the terms of my talk, a, a secular age, right? I think, um, you know, there's, uh, the case I would make, right, is that, uh, that Mormons, I, th I, I think, need not, um, play the game of thinking of, of Mormonism as, as a religion that is necessarily working against the grain of a secular age. Uh, the point, as I hope I made clear, is I think I see it as fully in the grain of, of a secular age, and those are the things that are most interesting about it to me, and those also, I think, make it, make it available, right, uh, for, um, for certain uh, yeah, certain philosophical and theoretical discourses that um, that uh, that it might otherwise seem not to um, not to have a place in. Um, the other thing, since I'm in trouble with Anne, clearly, is I have for for having get, you know, given a radically telescoped version of the longer paper that I sent her. Um, I want to thank her for the brilliant comment and and to to riff on on, on your idea of a meta question, uh, Matt. What I found, what came to light for me in her comment was that a question that this panel is raising is the question of the historical determination of Mormonism, right? And then the question of how much that should de determine what Mormon studies does, right? So we have a, 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 you know, a two-part sort of uh, consideration. One, to think about, well, what, you know, what are the frames with, when, within which we think about um, the historical determination of uh, of Mormonism. What makes it? What are the contingencies that uh, that that best illuminate 
uh, the most of its sort of distinctive um, contribution to use that really helpful language that, that Adam introduced. Um, you know, what are the centers of gravity that most warp its state space, right? That seems to me, you know, what are, what are the things that, that do give it a particular shape, right? And those are historical questions, right? We can't, it, it can't be anything, it can't be everything. Um, it, it, the, the, there's a, there's a, um, a determinacy to it that we have to reckon with. So there's a question about like, what are the best, what are the best frames within which to think about its historical determination? And then this, this other consideration of like, even once we have that, how much do we want to feel bound, bound by that? Um, or are there ways of framing its historical determination that might enable um, the freest kind of form of virtualizing Mormonism that, uh, that, that Adam's talking about. So that's my two cents. Okay, we'll take Sam's question and then uh, break. Thank you for a session so delightfully filigreed and tangled that I actually could not work on something else while I was listening to it. <laughs> As somebody that lives in both worlds of the traditional quote unquote science and the humanities, I'm always puzzled by some of the analogies and metaphors that get drawn from data science or physics to the application. So there's a question for uh, Adam. The state space metaphor does not work for me at all, and I want to think, I, I want to hear how it can be made to work. Uh, state space uh, is a cute way of saying whatever could be specified by a given number of variables, and the reality of state space is that it's radically, almost infinitely sparse. That's one of the actual problems in data science, is that you create a, a state space or a data space or uh, a, a potential for a data set, and the reality is that 99.9999% of a state space is empty. And in fact, what seems to be the case is that things evolve and uh, grow and shape and have path dependence that you kept gesturing toward. But there's a sense, I think, in which what you're trying to do with a state space is destabilize path dependence, but at the same time let it be open. And then I'm left with the question of, it, it seems to me that either the state space metaphor as it's being applied is trivial, or that it is a kind of postmodern neoplatonism a smuggling and this possibility that there's a data scientist specifying a state space as the possible permutations of values for variables is starts to feel a little bit like Plato and Aristotle and that thing, that order that hovers outside the material. Is that just the typical person saying something defiant and not asking a question or is there a question there? Could help me help me make state space other than either some trivial reference to the multiplicity of variables or a kind of smuggled Platonism, if you could. Question mark. Uh, you're astute, I think, to pick up on the way in which the virtual is, I think, uh, a kind of pluralized and temporalized version of platonic idealities. Uh, but I would argue that it's, it's, it is at least an attempt to think platonic idealities on a kind of pluralized, temporalized way. Um, are there limits to how far, how far that analogy can go? I think, yeah. I think, yeah. Though I think it is useful, uh, especially for just getting on the table the question of potentiality, especially as something that can't simply be reduced to actuality. Uh, so... Well, thanks again for our panelists. Let's give everyone a round of applause.